Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. What's the harm in hate speech? And can we even define what hate speech is? Today I will be joined by Jeremy Waldron, university professor at the New York University School of Law and an expert in the area. Professor Waldron is the author of many books, including The Harm in Hate Speech, which were originally the Oliver Wendell Holmes lectures at Harvard University, and most recently, One Another's Equals, The Basis of Human Equality. Today I'm really thrilled to speak with Professor Jeremy Waldron, who is university professor at New York University, where he teaches in the School of Law. Jeremy, thank you for several for making time. No, it's time a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be on this podcast. And we're sitting in your office, and I just walked down the hall, and I noticed there are pictures on the walls. There's a picture of a, a feminist, of Walt Whitman, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee of Student Protests. So, I was interested that the hallway of this law school expresses some values that we actually value free speech greatly. We actually honor people that probably in their day and age were controversial to say the least or completely against what this school probably thought was the right way of organizing things. Some of these people wouldn't even have been in these hallways. Now they are right. you know, featured and celebrated on the walls. But we put people on the walls partly because they are protesting, speaking freely, but also because they are speaking freely for causes that now we find attractive. Ex exactly. Now we, no, we think we celebrate a feminist, right? That's right. Women, we have women's right or a suffragette who... Yes. A hundred years ago, just a little more than a hundred years ago, didn't have the vote, wasn't enfranchised, and now we celebrate it just recently. Sure. But we don't put any pictures of neo-Nazis marching, expressing their rights to free speech. We don't, exactly. Yeah. Although this is, you're bringing up the right topic right away. The last two years, you wrote a book in 2012, The Harm and Hate Speech, really important book, really. First of all, thank you. I've learned a tremendous amount from this book. It's a kind of affirmative theory of conception of what is the point what are the values that either allow us to and think that regulating speech in this area, whether it's hate speech, is a good thing or it's a risky, dangerous thing where we have to throw up our constitutional outrage and say we're attacking the First Amendment in itself. Just like you said, we don't celebrate neo-Nazis on the walls, and it's a good thing. Right. But we do actually think, or some, a lot of people think, that when the neo-Nazis come to speak, they are actually defending also my right to speak. Yes. I don't know whether the neo-Nazis are defending my right to speak, but they are exemplifying the same right that I have to speak. Uh, neo-Nazis don't tend to be very constitutionally sophisticated. They come to proclaim their views, and sometimes they come to beat up anybody who opposes them. They will say they are standing up for free speech, but of course standing up for free speech doesn't mean, doesn't give you a reason for any particular view or any particular cause. And it doesn't give you a reason to exercise that right also in any it doesn't, direction. That, that's exactly right. That's true of all rights. So you have the right, but you don't have to act on it, first of all. Right. They, they do enlist, though, um, as we've seen from Skokie in 77 and then to today and Charlottesville a year ago, the New Nazis, they enlist civil liberties, the ACLU specifically, or other people, a lot of journalists on their side who say, no, we have to put up with this. They actually are exemplifying the test case for this. Yes, no, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to say, particularly in the United States where we don't have any laws strongly regulating the content of speech, then this is putting us to the test case, the most unpleasant speech we can imagine. How did you get interested in this in the first place? I mean, walking around the city or traveling around the world and seeing different legislative regimes, or right. what motivated you to do this? I tell you, it probably stemmed from my days in England when I was studying at Oxford because I popped into the Crown Court in Oxford one day and somebody was being on trial, somebody was on trial, a neo-Nazi, as it happens, on trial for hate speech. He had gone into a village near Oxford and pasted up posters all over the village depicting people of African descent as apes and chimpanzees and gibbons and gorillas and so on. And he'd been arrested under the Race Relations Act and prosecuted. And now he had pleaded not guilty, but it, he had uh, not contested the facts. 
and this very crusty old judge, who you would have thought was impatient with this newfangled hate speech legislation, gave the man a, a tremendous lecture. He said, how do you think we're going to run a multicultural society if idiots like you are allowed to bestialize your fellow citizens? And he sent him away for three months. Really? Yeah. As far as we know, England is still a functioning democracy, so it, it wasn't the end of civilization. It wasn't the end of civilization or the end of liberty. Yeah. But it was, a, so you said this is a kind of epiphanic moment for you where you realized, okay, there's something at stake here. There's one person's claim to say, this is my right to do it. I can do what I want. This is actually very important for a yes. citizen. Yes. And the judge saying, how can we all exercise this right or these rights? And Maybe it's about something else besides your intent, or I, is it what you want to do? I think that's right. It was, I mean, the, the English legislation, which dates from the 1960s, partly stems from the crisis in immigration that began around that time when people were bringing in immigrants from the Caribbean, from East Africa, from South Asia. And there was tremendous reaction against the immigrants and the prospect of serious intercommunal violence in England. And I think the government thought that it had to take some measures to secure the basis of elementary social peace. And this elementary social peace, is that really threatened or a risk if someone just puts up a poster or says a few bad things, or hurls a few epithets? I agree. I think there's two things to say about that. In many cases, no, it's not threatened. In some cases, we know that the putting up of a poster or a ratty little pamphlet being distributed can be one of, of a number of things. Mm -hmm that add up to a sort of slow-acting cumulative poison. It's like polluting the environment by failing to fit a emissions device to your car. Your car is not going to do any particular damage, but thousands of such cars will do damage. And there was a thought that, in some sense, intercommunal violence needs to be preempted. If we wait until the last minute when the fists are actually flying between communities, it's going to be very, very hard to walk that back. It's basically an environmental issue in a way. And remember the definition of hate speech. In a way it relates to the content, but the definition of hate speech, at least in the British Race Relations Act, was somebody intending to stir up hatred in the community. So the hatred is not the hatred expressed in the speech. The hatred is the hatred that's supposed to be elicited by the speech. And so it's somebody deliberately attacking social peace. So you're looking at it from this side of the impact of that speech in that's the community, right. where yes. other people will be authorized, galvanized, and excited to act on this, and it may not even be that particular person, but that person will foment this kind of... I think that's a worry. Whereas over here in the debate, people tend naturally to think that it's about punishing speech which expresses hatred, rather than speech that evokes right. hatred. That is, we think of it along the same lines as the debate about hate crimes. A hate crime, if I kill somebody and there's a racial motive, that's an aggravation of the offense and it's called a hate crime. And that has to do with the motivation of the actor. But here we're not interested in the motivation of the actor, we're, we're interested in the effect of what the actor does. So when you looked at these different countries where hate speech is really approached differently, and you know, I've talked to a lot of people, and you know, I grew up in Europe until some 35 years ago, and people sort of a lot of times respond to me and say, that's a European perspective, you don't understand America. Sure. We have the best possible current jurisprudence out there. Yeah, it's a, a common thing to say, as though it were an America-Europe contrast. Number one, it's a contrast between the United States and every other advanced democracy, so including Canada, Canada Australia, New South Zealand, Brazil, uh, South Africa, India, all these uh, other Israel, democracies. Israel, uh, yeah. So that's the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is that the hate speech provisions differ from country to country, and those differences are interesting and telling, partly dependent on their experience and are partly dependent on local circumstances. The third thing to say is that in each of these countries, whether you're talking about the United States or Germany, or New Zealand, where I come from, in each of these countries there's a controversy about free speech and hate speech. In none of these countries is there just unanimous acceptance that free speech must give way, or unanimous acceptance that free speech ought to triumph. There's a debate in the United States, there's a debate in Canada, there's certainly a debate in the UK and all over Europe. So these are countries who believe in free speech, but like us, they believe that free speech has its limits. We accept that in the United States, child pornography, sedition, libel, and so on. It's just partly a debate about where the limits are. It's partly a debate where to draw the line. Where to draw the line. And this question, so when you just said we accept that there are some kind of limits to free speech, that statement in itself, in large parts of the American public or press, 
would get you into loads of trouble. They say, no, 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 those carve-outs are not something we really focus on. This is not essential to what I think free speech is. Right, right. And one probably doesn't want to get too much into that argument back and forth. It's a matter of fact. And the fact is that somebody who produces child pornography will be prosecuted. Somebody who engages in sedition will be prosecuted. Somebody who engages in defamation within certain limits will be sued and liable for suit. Now, these are undeniable points. One could bicker about the semantics of it. Are these really limits on free speech or do they represent other principles? But functionally, they operate as limits. What you said a, a minute ago earlier about this case in an, in an English village and sort of it wasn't really so much the intent of the speaker but the possible impact of the speech in the community. Yes, let me be clear. It's a possible effect. Now, the law makes it an offense to do something with the intention of creating that effect. So there is still an intentional element. And or if the intention is not present, doing something that you ought to have known would have created so recklessness. But it's not the motivation, it's the intention with regard to the effect rather than the hateful motivation. Is it a matter that in America we just put the bar so much, I don't know what the metaphor would be, higher or lower, to say it has to be imminent, it has to be direct incitement, it has to be reasonable, it has to be so close that I can see basically the guy taking a swing before I actually stop him. That's exactly right. I think it's it's partly just a question of how far upstream you're willing to go with your prosecutions. We believe in the United States that only an imminent threat of violence or an imminent prospect of violence could possibly justify legal intervention. Now, that could be contested on a couple of grounds. One is, is it always just a matter of violence? Because you could create an atmosphere where life it becomes very discriminatory and miserable for members of minorities without anybody proposing to beat anybody up. Advocacy of racial discrimination, for example. Or you could create the the real prospect of violence, and it may be a prospect that can only be thwarted by action a little bit earlier than the imminent moment, just uh, just as we can only thwart certain forms of pollution by acting upstream from the toxic. So the question is maybe not sort of definition, is it imminent, is it incitement, who is the person to decide, but what are the effects or the impact of such speech, which sort of is in the ecosystem is in the air, it just floats around, we live in America, you have racists around, you better put up with it. That's exactly right. And I think the one argument against hate speech regulation that I greatly respect is the argument that says we don't know nearly enough about what the effects are. You know, we sometimes say, well, we compare the United States with Germany and we find that race relations are not much better in either either country. But that's not the appropriate comparison. The appropriate comparison is what would Germany be like without hate speech regulations, or what would England be like without hate speech regulations? It's an interesting, it's not quite a legal question anymore. So no, what would a country be if the laws were very different? That's in right, it's a counterfactual question. Yeah, so the, the, what, do right. you, what do you think when you've thought about this? What would England look like today, or what would Germany, That's right. everybody could freely express themselves? When we look back <laughs> at England today, and we look back at the decision, we ask, well, what, how would things have developed in England if there'd been no hate speech laws? And that's a counterfactual question. But the very same question asked ex ante at the time of enactment is the one question that the politicians have to answer, have to try to answer, because right. they have to ask what will be the future, what will the future be like if we don't enact And they this. were weighing these considerations and thinking this is going to take some freedom away from some people, but the ultimate outcome for the, what you said earlier, the social good, it is better for everybody, for the collective. I think that's right. And better in preventing the sort of the pollution of the environment, better f- for some sort of solicitude for the dignity of the minorities, and better, perhaps also at an expressive level, because law can sometimes express certain things. And the expression is, we're not going to tolerate this sort of speech. This is not who we are. So we as a country, or the legislature, we actually express certain values through our laws, not just to enforce them against individuals. I think that's right. And in the United States, we do that all the time, only we don't do it through state law. We do it through the kind of shared conventions that lead to a person like Roseanne Barr being instantly dismissed from her television show, racially offensive comments. We do it in the sense that if you or I were to speak in racial terms in the classroom, we would be probably dismissed from our position. Large organizations in the United States, in fact, administer hate speech codes all the time, and they do it socially. They do it as a matter of professional standards. So we don't regard it as unthinkable. We worry in the United States about the coercive apparatus of the law. But we don't particularly worry that Roseanne Barr has lost her livelihood. 
Some people do. Yes, Some people true. actually do for two reasons, I think. Some people, first of all, do say, well, this is her right to express this. There are some people who say she expressed something that lots of people share. That's right. Not even offensive. Or they thought it shouldn't be the Twitter mob who gets her fired because it's really ABC responding to people on Twitter. They're saying, isn't this unleashing what John Stuart Mill famously was more afraid of public opprobrium and shaming than of the government shutting you down? I think that's exactly right. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, it, of course, it's the whole theme of Mill on Liberty is that the, the legal sanction its main effect is that it reinforces the social sanction. Mm -hmm. And it's the social sanction that does the real deadening and silencing activity. What we need to notice is that in the United States, whatever we say about free speech, we have a very strong social sanction against hate speech. And probably that's a good thing. And one possibility is that that by itself is sufficient to keep I, this evil in, in I check. want to put some, a little bit of a point on this statement. I think the campus protests in the last two or three years that have shown that a good number of people in universities don't think there's enough social sanctioning of this kind of speech. And they say there's actually a complication because when university hosts people who you know are so deeply offensive to some people, it's not just tolerating their right to speak, but it's a tacit endorsement of the position. There is a worry, and people do sometimes portray it like that. I think it's probably a mistake to put it in those terms, but it's not a mistake to raise that possibility or to, or to raise that issue. The other thing we haven't talked about is the fact that any particular incident of offensive speech is going to elicit a vehement response at the level of speech by those who have been forced to listen to the neo-Nazis or the racists or whatever. There will be strong, noisy protest. And if the values of free speech uphold the hate speech, they've got to be able to uphold the response. You've written about this recently, and actually I saw you give a talk about this a couple months ago on uh, to narrow this to the idea of the heckler's veto. Yes. They get counter-protest. So there's speech, and then they protest against that speech, which the heckler's veto, when that's invoked, and the press at least said that's a bad thing, that's terrible, people should not be allowed to interrupt anybody. Yes. I mean, again, I, it's probably reflecting where I grew up and how I grew up, because I grew up in New Zealand where heckling, that is going along and shouting interruptions at public meetings was a purely respectable form of political activism. I don't know that it ever had much effect, but it was part of the training and skill of a public speaker to be able to handle or deal with hecklers. Now, it wasn't hecklers' veto, because the hecklers weren't trying to close the occasion down, nor were they offering violence, nor were they received with violence, but they were throwing importunate questions at the speaker so that the speaker could not have the audience entirely on his own terms. So, so you're saying the conception of free speech could function and say it gives you a right to speak and it gives you the freedom not to be censored or punished by the government, but it doesn't give you the right to be listened to on your terms the entire time, hold forth for an hour without interruption. That's exactly what I would say. And particularly if you're a controversial speaker going onto campus going to a college to spout some theory of racial superiority or whatever it is, you've got to understand you're going into a noisy environment of highly opinionated and passionate people. And the notion that the college authorities have a responsibility to ensure that the students are disciplined so that they will sit still in silence and listen to this nonsense. I think you have to understand you're going to a hard sell audience and they're going to make their displeasure clear while you're speaking, before you're speaking and after you're speaking. Let me ask you something. Who is supposed to speak back then? You said the people who are being addressed. Let's say you have some kind of uh, racist or somebody who espouses some theory of racial superiority and then inferiority. Are the people in the audience disproportionately summoned to respond when they are the targets of this speech? That puts a very great burden on them and requires them to bear a great weight, particularly if the original speech to which they, they have to respond is intimidatory and threatening. So probably, as you will find on most campuses, students who are not necessarily members of minority groups themselves will speak up for the members of the minority groups who are being targeted by the, the hate This speakers. I found incredibly interesting in a couple of the podcasts I've done. I've talked to students who said, I'm not here to explain to you what it feels like to be a student of color at the university. It's not my job. I'm here to learn. I'm not your teacher. They also said, but be careful. You're not speaking on our behalf. Right. So there's a kind of hard thing. So you wrote a book, in a way, stepping into this subject to say how do people appropriately respond if the burden is if there's two women in a law school class of 200 people and someone goes off and says women are not really fit for abstract thinking and shouldn't be in law schools, are the two women supposed to be the ones who stand up and say, I don't feel this is really inappropriate or an 
equal situation where I can learn properly. Right. I mean, I believe very strongly that everybody has a responsibility to stand mm -hmm. up and contest the speech. And probably everybody has a responsibility to think hard about the difficult predicament of those who are, in fact, the members of the minority in question. But I, I mean, and of course, there are always problems when person A purports to speak for person B. But that doesn't mean that person A should remain silent mm -hmm. until their time comes. It means that everybody has to try as sensitively as they can, but also in the circumstances as noisily as they can to, to engage with the original hate speaker. Why do you think in these debates end up in this place where you have a situation, controversial speaker, some students speak up, it is disproportionately, it is actually probably students of color who are targeted and then allies in a way, but then a lot of people say, well, we're going to defend the speaker because the speaker has been marginalized, campuses are too liberal, this guy had to have a place, place and time. Why does the weight shift to say he's the, he becomes the martyr for He becomes speech? the victim, yes. Yeah. It's possible in the interaction that you may have multiple martyrs, martyrs on both sides. And um, so he will always find somebody who will stand up for him. And sometimes it's faux martyrdom, it's false martyrdom, or it's an occasion that has been rigged to look like martyrdom. Some clown provocateur comes in with the specific intention right. of hoping to create some heckler's veto or some, some difficulty in speaking so that he can or she can then present themselves as a martyr for free speech. And I don't know that we should regard that as respectable. But we can't do anything about it. But we, we People are trying to do things. So as you know, there are proposals in different legislatures in different states to actually penalize students who interfere with someone's speech. It leaves the burden on administrators and teachers to judge whether when I interrupted you, Professor Waldron, and I do it the second time, I now have to be penalized in a state university. Right, right. It seems very odd to do that because what we're mostly talking about in these cases are not classroom interruptions. We're not talking about people interrupting lectures or interrupting laboratories or seminars. We're talking about people interrupting speakers who have been brought onto campus by one political group of students to annoy another political group of students and to say, therefore, the people who they're deliberately setting out to annoy must not be allowed to, permitted to respond. I think that's a misconceived. What's odd about it to me, it seems that this is an appeal to the state to interfere in a situation where actually free speech advocates or self stand up looters say the state should stay out of this. Yes, I think the state should stay out of it. And one thing I think would be a, a good point to acknowledge is that although it may be important for these views to be heard, I'm not saying that is true, but I can understand somebody who does think that, it's not necessarily important that they be heard in silence. It may be important that they be heard with a certain amount of noise and protest. That's the way real life operates. And people respond angrily, vociferously to these views, and that seems to me to be as much a matter of a reasonable response as the, as the original speech is. So the notion that the, the state legislatures should be cultivating this passivity and silence on behalf of students on an occasion that's been deliberately set up to provoke people seems to me to be a misconceived. Well, it seems to me to go a bit contrary to the intentions of, at, say, Madison and sort of the founders who said who wanted to empower the citizen against the oppressive c capacity of the state to enact force. I think that's right. Now, it is true that under the auspices of free speech, we do expect the government to protect certain speakers, to protect rights of protest, and to act as a sort of traffic cop for rival protests if protesters are not trying to occupy exactly the same space at the same time. So the, the officials of the government have some proactive role to play. It's always the case, it's a paradox of rights, that governments are both the main threat to our rights and governments are at the same time the main guarantors of right. our rights, and they, the, the government has to balance both those cards. In a dissent, Justice Kagan on Tuesday in the Janus decision, the union or the agency fee decision, she said at the end of her dissent that the, the First Amendment is used as a sword to adjudicate certain things in ways in which maybe it hadn't been intended. It's being weaponized. It's weaponized. She said, called it a sword, and it's weaponized. And in some ways, she's raising a concern that, this, that speech comes into these kind of decisions. Recently, there, we've seen a couple of decisions that students have also expressed, they say, people say the First Amendment to actually shut me down, right. not to empower me. Yeah, no, th there's something to what Justice Kagan said along those lines. But notice the application of the First Amendment is one thing. It applies particularly in state universities. It applies 
with regard to the actions of the police and the actions of the legislative authorities. But behind the First Amendment, much more broad, is a general principle, which we all accept, that by and large speech should be free. It should be free on private campuses, it should be free even when there's no question of legal interference. We believe in free speech, as I said, even though people disagree about its limits, the, the belief in the principle is virtually universal. So sometimes it's not a good idea to get bogged down on the technicalities of the application of the First Amendment per se, but to see what the campaign for free speech in the United States has in common with the campaign for free speech in Germany or in New Zealand. Or and what's behind it to take it out of the First Amendment, in some cases an inappropriate discussion because the First Amendment doesn't maybe apply in certain situations, sure. as you said, in corporations, workplaces, private universities, where it's maybe helpful, but maybe it's more helpful to say what is driving this this value of, of free speech. So to go back to England or France or Germany or any of those other countries, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Brazil, do you think this fear is justified in America that if we went down this road, we would end up where they are today, which must be worse, I presume? <laughs> must be worse in what respect? In the respect that it, they don't acknowledge and honor freedom of expression is the, the matrix as, or the fundamental bedrock of all freedoms. Well, I don't know whether anybody says it's a matrix and fundamental bedrock. Justice Cardozo actually says, I was at Cardozo Law School, it's on the window. So I noticed it and I wrote it down. And it's the matrix that, from which all other freedoms arise. Right, <laughs> that's right. But when people turn their attention in a slightly different direction, suddenly they're announcing the right to private property as a matrix from which all freedoms that's right. derive. <laughs> and I've written about the right to vote being the matrix. From right. which all, so people can get awfully overwrought. Of what's the bedrock principle, yeah. What's the bedrock principle. <laughs> but the fact is that there are a lot of Europeans and there are a lot of Antipodeans and people who would say, yeah, free speech really is a, a pretty strongly bedrock principle. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's unlimited. Mm -hmm. It does mean that it's very, very important. And I don't know that there's any dispute about that. An awful lot of people would say there's massively greater political freedom in many of the countries that you've mentioned than there is in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's no attempt to suppress voting. People can stand for socialist and communist ideas without being run out of town. There's a much broader tolerance of a diversity of points of views, points of view in New Zealand, Canada, or Germany, and, and so on. So it's just on the specific question of stirring up hatred, right. attempting to foment social discord and attack the dignity of citizens. I've heard this argument from some of your colleagues, sort of constitutional lawyers, who've said, well, for you this is different. You're from Germany and in your country the grave crime of the Holocaust, sort of this incommensurate crime of state legislative hate-based violence of, of a genocide is very different and warrants this kind of approach. In this country, we don't have such an issue. In this country, we've never had any history of racial terrorism. Is that what they would say? That's or we've never had They actually leave it out, and I've actually asked, have we never had any kind of race-based terror? Or, and which is not The United States I mean, didn't have anything like the Holocaust, but it was disfigured for a century or more. Hundreds by, of years by... That's right, by racial terror. And so this is interesting that you would say that, because I've actually asked, and I meant to ask, this doesn't mean, does it, it doesn't take away anything from the incommensurability of the Holocaust, but there are other events that also shape how we think as a country in the United States. That's exactly right. And moreover, unless one believes in a highly particularistic account of what happened in Germany in the 1930s and 40s, one has to consider the possibility it might have happened elsewhere under certain conditions. So in the 1950s, in the United States, in the last case that favorably, where the Supreme Court favorably considered hate speech regulations, a case called Bohane against Illinois, the majority of the Supreme Court justices referred to the German example. And they thought, now five years later in the United States, we have to consider whether it is tolerable to accept this sort of danger or risk to a multi-racial society. They said, we watched what happened in Germany and we're supposed to learn from it. This notion that the United States is immune from such catastrophes, I think is a very foolish idea. I think it's an, this is a really, this is a part where and the understanding of the Supreme Court history and jurisprudential history only works against this background of what's happening historically. So Bohane, group libel case, so-called encroaching, encroaching Negroes, so sort of people moving into neighborhoods, and the justices acknowledge this could lead to terrible things. But then 10 years later, you have the civil rights movement, which is actually 
addressing other concerns, and the court moves in another direction, never picks up this case again. That's right. And leaves it, and, and I've been told in pretty strong terms that it is bad form to bring this case up. It's not discussed as yeah, anti canon or people Jamal beca- Reeves. People, <laughs> people, <laughs> people become very annoyed when I bring it up. The fact is that beyond that, we have had a series of difficult, subtle, problematic cases about things like cross burning mm-hmm. and clan demonstrations. And you've found justices on all sides of this matter, very, very strong dissent from Clarence Thomas against the majority position that said cross-burning is not per se intimidatory. Justice Thomas said, did you grow up seeing crosses burn? So we have had to wrestle with this. The other point to make about this difference in history between Germany and the United States, the alleged difference, okay, maybe that says why there are some particular issues in Germany. There are issues about Holocaust denial, for example because a country in which these crimes were committed must have a determined resolution never to forget that these things happened. But we're not just talking about Germany. We're talking about Great Britain. We're talking about Australia. We're talking about Canada. France. I mean, the the Canadian history is not disfigured by a Holocaust. And there you cannot dispute that it happened as a fact. It's actually not disputing the facts. It touches on something really strange that we're living in a time right now where we're living in a time of alternative facts and fake news. Do you think this shapes this discussion in a certain way? Suddenly this kind of influx of things that are fake or not fake or you can't tell anymore, does it have any bearing on these conversations? I don't know. Obviously it raises questions about free speech and particularly freedom of the press. But I must say in, in all my debates, both in the UK and in the United States, about hate speech, I've always debated with very honorable people, Nadine Strawson, former head of the ACLU. I've done a podcast with her. Right, yes. Timothy Garton Ash and William yes. know Timothy yes. in Oxford. And the, the work that those people do, even though they're on the other side of this argument, has always struck me as truthful, yes. as honest, and as honorable. So I've never seen this particular debate. I think it's an interesting debate. There really are considerations on both sides. It's interesting. I'm happy you point that out because, you know, I follow this debate to the extent I'm, I'm capable of reading at a speed that where things are published every day. <laughs> You bring up two critical elements in your work, which is equality and dignity. Yes. I'm going to try to get in touch with Timothy Garton Ash in his book, Free Speech, which is a study around the world. The word equality does not show up in that entire book, <laughs> in the index, which is interesting to me. It's offense. There's all sorts of things, controversial, things you don't agree with. When you're talking about equality and dignity, what do you mean by those two conceptions in relation to hate speech? Right. Equality is going to work in at least two ways. First of all, any right that people have is a, is a right that's held equally, uh, if it's a matter of constitutional or human rights. So equality is working in a, at a purely formal level. But certainly some sense of equality that we live in a community of equals, despite our differences, is one of the things that's possibly threatened by hate speech. Right. And it's one of the things that enrages the hate speakers. So the prote- What part enrages the hate speakers? The though? very notion that would they are required to live on equal terms which uh, with to racial be, minorities. seems to be a bedrock principle of this country. It does. <laughs> it is, and it ought to be. I'm not saying it's, it's universally adopted. With dignity, it's an interesting thing, because dignity, I really do think, could be invoked on both sides of this debate. Mm-hmm. Certainly, the, there is some dignity to the position that somebody says, how dare you tell me what to say? Yeah? I'm my own person. I, I should be allowed to say what I like. This a certain assertion of dignity in that, and I don't want to deny... I don't think it's the be-all or end-all of the debate. But on the other side, and this is something that in the Harm and Hate Speech book I spent a lot of time, dignity in the sense of the ordinary social standing and basic respect accorded to all citizens, that is the target of the hate speakers. That is the thing they are seeking to undermine. That is the thinking that they are issuing calls to arms to try to undermine during the Skokie controversy about the neo-Nazis mm-hmm. marching in the little town near Chicago, the leader of the neo-Nazis says, one of our aims is to call out to the honest, hard-working anti-Semites in the society to get them to come out of the woodwork mm-hmm. and realize that they're not alone and mm-hmm. they can stand with us. And the point of that standing is not just a pure matter of display. It's a deliberate attempt to undermine the basic dignity, by which I mean the basic respect and social standing Mm -hmm. of members of minorities in a community which, as you say, is supposed to be a community of equals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It goes beyond a mere symbolic display because it's it's also a display of potential force. I think it's a display of potential force. And this is what we've seen in Charlottesville, actually, where 
you know, you have neo-Nazis clad in khakis and polo shirts and with good haircuts, looking respectable, to actually legitimate, but really trying to show a community who's, who's in charge and who has power. Yeah, that's right. Don't forget about us. Don't ever forget that we exist and be very afraid. Well, I want to ask one other thing you touch upon in your book as well. The debates that have been roiling the nation the last two or three years, they're really almost always about race and racism. It's almost exclusively, when you look at the campus controversies, they're not about Holocaust deniers, they're not about flat earthers. They're really about you know, racially incendiary speech. And they're not really as much as they were in the 90s about obscenity in relation to gender. Sure. That was a driving force of that discussion that you were also part of with the work of Catherine McKinnon, Mary Matsuda, Richard sure. Delgado, Kimberly Crenshaw. And I'm interested why gender, do you think, hasn't shown up in this, this time of the cultural wars? Right. It's really hard to tell at the moment why gender hasn't shown up. It, it crops up occasionally. In Me Too also. There's probably That's maybe I'm forgetting one entire well, dimension. Well, Me Too is one <laughs> aspect. And, but also when somebody stands up and says women can't do science or some, and says this on campus. Which uh, has resulted in <laughs> somebody <laughs> losing his job and somebody being, losing being promoted his, up to run the economy of the country. Absolutely, <laughs> that's right. But it is true. I found it quite useful to use Kitty McKinnon's work on pornography as a kind of a template. It's not exactly equivalent to the hate speech issue, but it's interestingly connected with it. And she would say it relates to equality and relates, relates to dignity. Can you give us one sentence on how she frames this issue? Because it's not about offended feelings. It, isn't about it is not about offended feelings. It's about equality. It's about pornography as an educational device enlisting the force of very, very intense feelings and emotions in the service of making people accustomed to seeing women as objects of degradation. Mm -hmm. And so she's very concerned about the psychodynamics of pornography mm -hmm. and about the immediate effect as to how women are seen in the community. Which is something the law recognizes. We see, we saw in Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, the law recognizes actually the harmful effects of racial stereotypes or other things on, on students, for I think I think that's right. But I will mention two other yeah. things. I mean, one is the issue of homophobia. Yeah. And, and that has been at stake in the recent discussions oh, that's of, right. of hate yeah. speech. Yeah. And the other thing really is religious hate speech, mm -hmm. particularly anti-Muslim hate speech. Mm -hmm. Around 2006, the British felt the need to add into their racial hate speech legislation some provisions about religious hate speech. Now, partly this was a kind of quid pro quo for the cooperation they were demanding from Muslim authorities and Muslim communities in combating terrorism. It was partly a reflection also that they were dismantling traditional protections against blasphemy. But they were insisting that it was an offense entirely analogous to racial hate speech to attempt to stir up hatred against Muslims or against any members of a religious group. And the remarkable thing there is, I don't want to go on too long about this, but the remarkable thing was the incorporation into that 2006 law, which was now part of the Public Order Act, of a provision that specifically said we're not talking about somebody who makes fun of or criticizes or attacks the creed of a particular religion, or it even attacks the founder of the particular religion, whether it's Jesus or Muhammad. Or, we're not talking about that. That is not being legally banned. What we are worried about is people stirring up hatred against the adherents of the religion. And so the famous section 29J, which if I wanted to bore your listeners, I would quote. And it no, but I do like to hear, if you can do a little bit. Of I can do it. and. Uh, so this is Section 29J of the Racial and Religious Hatred Act, 2006. Nothing in this part shall be read or given effect in a way which prohibits or restricts discussion, criticism, or expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult, or abuse of particular religions, or the beliefs or practices of their adherents, or of any other belief system, or the beliefs and practices of its adherents, or proselytizing or urging adherents of a different religion to cease practicing their religion or the belief system. So all of that is exempt, whereas the operative provisions still remain. It's an offense to intentionally or recklessly stir up hatred against the adherents of the religion. And you think that's sensible? You think that's sensible, that can be enforced without a kind of danger that it's over-enforced and or over-brought? Do you think it's specific enough? I think it's specific enough. It's, I mean, everything here is very difficult. And you must remember that the English legislation is associated with very, very strong filters on prosecutorial discretion. That is, any prosecution under any of these provisions requires the consent of the Attorney General. Mm 
this, I think, represents exactly the way the compromise with free speech is being made, because the clause that I just read out is protecting free speech of a certain kind, while leaving room for a very, very narrowly focused prohibition to operate. Now, if you speak to Timothy Garton Ash about this, um, he will say, well, this was a last-minute compromise and it effectively emasculated the religious hatred provisions. I don't believe that's true, but what it does very clearly is it indicates the aim is not to protect religion. The aim is not to protect right, right, religious right. adherence against offense or being offended. It's to protect them against having hatred stirred up against right. them. But that's the other distinction you made earlier. It's not about offended feelings and that's right. feeling uh, sort of aggravated, annoyed, frustrated, or offended, but actually being targeted right. as a member of that group. Right. Now, that's not true of all hate speech provisions all over the world. The Australian one is particularly egregious because it does claim to protect people from offense. And I've argued in front of a conference of Australian judges that, that this is a misconceived approach to hate speech. And how did they receive you uh, exercising your free speech at that moment? Oh, a certain a polite <laughs> patter of applause. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's also that in academia, though, that you have a way of going <laughs> in the legal profession to actually right. sh show that. <laughs> but there was also a suggestion that having taken the wrong fork in this road, they weren't about to do a U-turn. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Jeremy, I want to thank you. It's been incredibly informative. Actually, it's a lot of fun for me, and I feel very privileged to sit in a kind of august office at the New York University School of Law. So august is a word for untidy. <laughs> august, it's filled with books. So thank you, Jeremy Waldron, university professor, the author of The Harm and Hate Speech, many other articles for a long time now on all sorts of aspects touching on that issue. So thank you for taking time. Thank out you of for your, having me. Thank you very yourself. much. Okay, let's Good. talk again. Thank you.